last generation to own cars. Our kids and grandkids, they may never have to learn to drive. They may never have to worry about driving around and looking for parking, or speeding tickets, or drunk driving. And the best part is, they could go their entire life without ever seeing a car accident. Driverless cars are being touted as one of the most disruptive technologies of our time. This future could actually be our reality, and it's exactly why I'm so excited about them. I've spent most of my career helping to address society's transportation challenges. I've helped public transit agencies find funding and figure out how to best spend it. I've helped cities introduce bike share into their transportation systems. And most recently, I've been focused on carpooling and how to connect drivers and riders in the San Francisco Bay Area. From public transit to bike sharing to ride sharing, each of these transportation modes requires two things, government investment and people's participation. It's through that lens that I've been thinking about driverless cars. What should the government's role be, and how will people respond to them? So let's back up. What are driverless cars? The federal government describes fully automated or driverless cars by stating that the driver is expected to provide destination or navigation input, but they're not expected to be available for control at any time during the trip. This means that the driver can literally be sleeping or working, or working out, or playing Candy Crush. The options are endless. Here's a picture of a driverless car. You see, it's not that different from what cars look like today. In the future, however, the design could change drastically. Don't be fooled. Cars that have partial automation are not driverless. Many automakers are introducing semi-autonomous features, like self-parking, or adaptive cruise control. And while these are important steps on the pathway to full automation, it's not driverless. Driverless requires absolutely no input for the entire duration of the trip. The other key aspect of driverless cars is that all of the technology is on or in the car. The car relies on sensors, radar, LIDAR, and other technologies in conjunction with mapping to be able to make navigation decisions. So when are these robocars actually coming? Believe it or not, they're here. They're currently driving around and being tested in the San Francisco Bay Area, Ann Arbor, Las Vegas, Austin, and many other cities around the world. About a year and a half ago, I was driving in the Bay Area on a highway. A Google driverless car rolled up next to me. I did what anyone would do in that situation, and I took a picture. We all know these cars are not everywhere, but automakers and technology developers are estimating that they're going to be publicly available in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe. This is literally in two to four years. I keep telling my grandparents this is going to happen in their lifetime. The technology is not the only challenge that needs to be addressed. There are still many other questions that need to be figured out. For example, who will own and protect my travel data? I don't know about you, but I don't love the idea of Ford or Google knowing where I'm going at all times. How will driverless cars be protected from hackers and terrorists? Cybersecurity is a major issue that the government is grappling with right now. Who will be responsible if, my, if a driverless car gets into an accident? The driver, the technology developer, the automaker? And what happens if a driverless car gets into an accident with a, with a regular car? Who is at fault then? What should the role of government be? Will licenses be required for the driver or for the vehicle? What roadway or infrastructure changes might be needed? Will we have new speed limits, better lane markings, maybe no more on-street parking? And finally, will people actually get into these driverless cars? Currently, less than half of Americans would even consider it. So these are all really tough questions, but there are a lot of people working on it right now, so I expect that in the next couple of years, they're all going to get addressed. This puzzle will come together. So the question then becomes, how are we going to get from today's driving society to this future driverless society? So here's how I see it happening. First, the freight industry could introduce driverless trucks. 
they seem like a likely early adopter since they operate mostly on highways and there could be significant cost savings for that industry. Then I can see vehicles that don't have passengers using them like street cleaning or parking enforcement. And then, as people get more used to the idea of the technology, I can see private passenger services like Uber and Lyft incorporating them into their business. And soon after that, I can see public transit agencies trying driverless buses and auto dealerships incorporating driverless cars into their lots. Have you ever reminisced about the days that we used to use VCRs and answering machines and laughed? Realistically, I expect that in 10 to 15 years, we're all going to be very comfortable getting into a driverless car, and we're going to laugh that we ever considered letting humans operate vehicles. <laughs> so we should all be really excited about driverless cars, but there's also reason to worry. I'll start first with the good stuff. The world is going to be a much safer place. Today, 9 out of 10 accidents that happen on our roadway are due to human error. Think drunk driving, distracted driving, speeding. If we eliminate humans from the driving equation, we eliminate 9 out of 10 of our accidents. The other really big benefit is that current, many current non-drivers will have new ways to get around. Grandma will be able to jump into her car without anyone fearing for their life. Blind people are going to be able to travel effortlessly. Drunk drivers will be able to grab their keys without anyone having to worry. And kids will be able to get home on their own from their after-school activities. So that all sounds pretty great. Let's fast forward 25 years and imagine what this future world with all driverless cars will look like. And as long as we're fantasizing, let's pretend that my husband and I live in the San Francisco suburbs in a mansion, of course, with our two kids. It's Monday morning. I wake up, get my kids ready for school, and I summon our private car to come and pick them up, take them to school. The car comes back, I get ready, and I hop in. I love this car. The car has a designated work area and sleep area. It has a coffee maker, a fully stocked refrigerator, surround sound, HDTV projected on the back panel. This is by far my favorite part of the day. I sit and I sip on my coffee, read the news. I usually have time to get a head start on my work day. I realize that I'm probably sitting in traffic for most of this commute, but it doesn't bother me because I love this space and this alone time so much. So I get to my office, and I realize that I don't have any food in the house for dinner that night. So I pull out my phone, pick out the groceries I need, and I send my car to the grocery store. The trunk, of course, has a refrigeration unit. <laughs> then the car knows that it has no other assignments, so it goes and drives to the remote parking lot about 15 miles outside of the city, and it waits. I also realize that my kids have soccer practice that day, so I schedule the car so it knows to go pick them up at the end of the day and bring them home. I then go about my work day. At around 3 p.m., I get a call from my kid's school that my son is sick and needs to be picked up. So I summon my car to come pick me up in the office. It brings me to the school where I'm able to pick up my son, and then the car takes me home. Well, this scenario sounds amazing, besides the sick kid. I basically have a personal assistant between my smartphone and my driverless car. Who wouldn't want that? Well, imagine if every other person approached their commute the same way. Imagine if everybody owned their own car and they all traveled to work by themselves. The difference between today's world and this future world is that the car is able to make trips even when the driver isn't in it. Those trips to the grocery store and the remote parking lot, those would add up. In fact, I would estimate that my car on that Monday is traveling at least five times the mileage of what a car today would. This could result in mass congestion. It could mean it could make today's traffic look like nothing. So let's play out the same scenario, but in a more ideal way, without anybody owning cars. OK, so it's Monday morning. I wake up, get my kids ready for school, and I get them onto their driverless school bus. Then I finish getting ready, and I use my phone to order a ride. 
About two minutes later, a driverless pod car shows up at my door, picks me up, picks up a couple of my neighbors along the way, and takes us to the local train station. It is perfectly timed, so I get there just as the train is rolling in. I hop in, get on the train, catch up on some work emails, take a quick nap, and before I know it, I'm in downtown San Francisco. I come out of the train station, grab a bike share bike, and I bike the last mile to my office. At no point did I take out my wallet. The whole thing was paid for seamlessly with my smartphone. Then, while I'm at my office, I realize that we don't have any food in the house for dinner. So I pull out my smartphone, pick out the groceries I need, and I schedule a grocery delivery for that evening. I also realize that my kids have soccer practice. So again, with my phone, I schedule a carpool so that they have a way to get home. I then go about my work day. Around 3 p.m., I get a call from my kids' school that my son is sick and needs to be picked up. I decide to forego the train, since the train is a little far from my kids' school, and instead I order a private car. It's worth it to me to pay a little extra to get that quick ride. So the car shows up two minutes later, takes me to my kids' school, and then that same car takes us home. Well, this scenario doesn't sound so bad. The problem is I'm not convinced that it could actually happen. This assumes that people are willing to not own cars. It also assumes that they're willing to rely on public transit and carpool. Today, four out of five Americans drive to work alone, and less than one in 10 are willing to carpool. So I hope you can see why private ownership of driverless cars should have us all worried. The big difference in that first scenario is that people are using their cars very similar to how they're using cars today. In fact, we spend thousands of dollars to own cars, and yet they sit idle 95% of the time. And then when we do use our cars, the back seats are usually empty. I find it even more ironic that one of the first things we teach our kids to do is share. If our kids can share their toys, why can't we as adults learn to share our vehicles? The good news is that more and more apps and services are coming out to help us fill those empty and idle seats. Zipcar, Karma, Scoop, and Chariot are just a few of the companies that are helping to make car sharing and ride sharing that much more commonplace today. Personally, I don't own a car in San Francisco, and I use services like these all the time. Not only that, but many automakers are starting to introduce these services into their service offerings. For example, BMW recently partnered with Drive Now and Move It so they can incorporate car sharing and ride sharing into their business model. Clearly, automakers are realizing that selling cars may not be the core business of the future. That, combined with the fact that people are buying less cars today, makes me hopeful that we're not leading to a society of mass congestion. I believe that the combination of good government investment and policy, combined with people making good decisions, will lead to something closer to that ideal scenario that I described. I also believe that we as a society will reap the benefits of driverless cars, but we don't, won't abuse them. I'm hopeful that the government will invest in public transportation so that it's reliable and well-priced and seamlessly connected with other forms of transportation. Clearly, the government needs to worry about more than just licensing. In fact, they'll need to address issues like greenhouse gas emissions, accessibility, congestion. I'm also hopeful that we will defer to ride-sharing because it's a desirable and convenient option. And most importantly, I'm hopeful that we, that dream car that I described, that it will actually become a reality. But, that it will be expensive, so that it's a treat and not an everyday thing. Personally, I'm really excited about driverless cars, and not just for the ability to play Candy Crush on my commute. I'm excited that during my lifetime, there's going to be a transformation in how we live and get around. I'm also excited for them to come sooner rather than later. I'm getting married in September, and it's my dream that my husband-to-be and me get driven off into the sunset in a driverless car. <laughs> driverless cars really are coming soon, and there's no question they're going to have a huge transformation on our society. The roads are going to be safer, 
and many current non-drivers are going to have new ways to get around. It's yet to be seen if driverless cars cause mass congestion, but I'm hopeful that we as a society won't let that happen. We all have a part to play in our future, and my hope is that we all remember the importance of sharing. If our kids can share their toys, we too can share our vehicles.